Okay. Hey, this is a lecture for my seventh hour class on the 29th of March. Anyway, a diplomacy is the act of one nation giving another nation, get this down, this is what diplomacy is, it's the, it's the ability or the act of one nation to get another nation to do what it wants it to do. It's the ability of us to, to talk and negotiate with Canada and get the Canadians to do what we want Canada to do. Okay, that's diplomacy. Diplomacy. And people who conduct those negotiations are called diplomats. What's another word for people who go around and negotiate on behalf of the United States to try and get other countries to do what the United States wants it to do? Is there another word for that? They represent the United States in foreign countries. What are those people? Sorry? Well, they're representatives, but there's a specific word for them. Ambassadors. Write that down, okay? And there you see there are 200 countries in the world, roughly 200 countries. And the United States has an ambassador in each one of those, in, in most of those countries. And by the way, most of these countries that you see on this map, they also have an ambassador or a diplomat in the United States uh, to negotiate with the United States. If there's a problem in South Africa in the United States, we don't you know, usually go to war. Hopefully we don't go to war and attack South Africa, or they don't come to war and attack us. We sit down and we negotiate, try and negotiate our differences. You understand that? And the people that do that are the diplomats. The people that do that are ambassadors. And what they practice, you know, that trying to get countries to settle their differences peacefully instead of through war is called diplomacy, okay? Diplomacy, all right? Write that down. And there, so that, everybody understand what I'm talking about. Now, and there are two major types of diplomacy. There are two major ways to get countries to do what you want them to do. And every president of the United States has practiced these. One is called dollar diplomacy. Okay, dollar diplomacy, and the other is called gunboat diplomacy. And Teddy Roosevelt and every other president has used these two types of diplomacy. Uh, what is dollar diplomacy? What does that amount to? What is dollar diplomacy? What? Pay a country to do what? What we want them to do. I can give you an illustration right here. And I don't know if you can see this. I'm sure your eyes are good enough. But right there is the world's largest peninsula. It's called Saudi Arabia. Uh, here is the Middle East. Okay, My hand is covering the region. You've heard of the Middle East. My hand is covering the region that we call. By the way, what is the ethnicity of most? What is the race of most people who live in the Middle East? Not all of them, but most people. Huh? They're... Thank you. I've asked that all day, and uh, you know, I think somebody said the Irish this morning. But anyway, uh, Arabs, okay, people who are Arabs. That's the majority. Now there are Jews, Israelis. There are Turks. There are Iranians. The Iranians are Persians. They're not Arabs, but the majority of people there are Arabs, okay. And what? Which religion do most Arabs uh, practice? What is their religion? Muslims. Actually, Muslims, you're right, but Muslims, those are people who practice their religion. What's the name of the religion that Muslims practice? You're right. You haven't said anything wrong. Uh, Islam, okay? All right? So most Arabs are Islam. It's Islamic. But you know what? We, the United States, this country from the other side of the globe with many different values and the majority of people who practice the religion in our part of the world, are Christians, okay? We're the West, Christians. Uh, the, these Arabs here, these Arabs uh, have allowed us to put military bases in their country and conduct raids against other Islamic Arab countries. Why have they done that? Why do they, huh? We, we, and what do we call that money that we give to Saudi Arabia and other countries all around the globe every, what? Well, it's, it's, it's dollar diplomacy, and another word for that, get this down, is foreign aid. Have you heard of people talk about foreign aid? We give countries money all over the world, and other countries give other. 
you know, I'm not saying it's us alone, but we're just using the United States for an example, since this is U.S. history class. But anyway, uh, the United States gives money to nations all over the world. Let me show you some here, right here in Central America. Countries like uh, Nicaragua uh, and Costa Rica uh, and Honduras and Panama. Right now there's a crisis going on there. There's one in Venezuela. And a lot of the immigration, in fact, the majority of immigration coming into the United States, someone mentioned a while ago, one of our great problems is the immigration. They're not coming from Mexico. They're coming from these countries. Now, they're coming through Mexico, many of them, but they're coming through these countries. And one way the United States wants to try and solve that problem is upping the foreign aid, upping the amount of money we give to these countries so it will boost their economy and their people can stay home. Because I would bet that the majority of people who live in Nicaragua are Nicaraguans and they're happy to be in Nicaragua, but because of gang warfare, uh, threats to their lives, uh, poverty in general, they can't stay there. Uh, it's not like everybody says, oh my God, if we just get the, a lot of people do, but a lot of people, you know, Brazilians are, are pretty content to stay in Brazil. And by the way, Brazil is facing an immigration problem too. People are leaving Venezuela where the situation is pretty bad and they're going to Brazil. They're not just coming to the United States. In fact, right now, immigration, the shifting of large populations, is worldwide. It's not just here. We tend to just look at our own little house here, but it's not just here. One of the ways the United States wants to solve that is through foreign aid. We will up the foreign aid to help you build up your economy, and, you know, maybe that will alleviate some of the uh, uh, immigration crisis here in the United States. My point is, is I'm giving you examples of how foreign aid is used, okay? By the way, what if Saudi Arabia said tomorrow, and they could do this, you Americans have to take away every Navy base, every Air Force base, every Army base that you have in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, we don't want you here. Get out. Would we have to leave? Yeah. Yes, we would. And by the, old, well, by the way, what do you think we would say to them as we were leaving? Well, we'd probably say a lot of things. But what do you think we would say to them as we were leaving? Related to what we're talking about here. Give us our money back. What? Give us our money back. Give up our what? Ask for the money back. Well, maybe not the money back, but what would we say about the money that we give them every year? We're going to cut it off. That was, and they might say, good. Of course, Saudi Arabia, that's where most of the oil in the world is. They're richer than God, as somebody used to say. But anyway, yeah. You know, you don't want, you know, okay, we'll leave. We'll cut up more. This might be something that we did. We'll cut off foreign aid. So that's the way dollar diplomacy works. Now, the gunboat diplomacy. What's gunboat diplomacy? If you want a country to do something and they won't do it, what do we do? Threaten them. What? <coughs> you don't just threaten. Well, you might threaten, threaten them with what? Uh, warning shot. Huh? Warning shot. Well, military action. You know, if you don't do what we want, we're going to send in the military. That's gunboat. Diplomacy, gunboat diplomacy, okay? So it's getting nations, and it's not just the United States, we've used both of these. It's getting nations to do what your nation wants them to do by using military force, okay? So those, that's what diplomacy is. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, right now, American ambassador, the American ambassador and the Mexican ambassador, they're... Uh, locked in diplomacy. They're talking about the fentanyl problem, you know, the, the idea that China here is sending fentanyl to the United States across the southern border uh, to, uh, you know, help uh, kill Americans, to help destroy Americans. And um, anyway, um, you know, I, I will just do a little commentary here, this notion that all these mean old people are sending these drugs to the United States, and we don't really want them, but uh, since they're here, we'll just take them and kill ourselves. Listen, I'll tell you what the drug problem in the United States will end. You know what that is? <clears throat> well, we don't want drugs. We want them. I don't know if China's sending them or not. I guess they are. I've heard on reliable documentaries that China's doing that here. But if China or whoever's supplying this country with drugs, if they would stop it tomorrow, we'd go get them. We'd go get them. When we no longer want drugs, there won't be a drug problem in this country. We're the most drug-addicted country in the world. Think about that. What's wrong with us? We've got it better than most, but we're the most drug addicted country in the world. Anyway, negotiations are going on about that. I'm sure the American ambassador, the American ambassador that we have over here in Beijing, I'm sure he's brought that up with the Chinese government many times. We haven't bombed China over it. They haven't bombed us over it. We're 
trying to settle this through diplomacy, okay? Diplomacy. Well, all right. Well, get this down. Roosevelt, so, part, so now that we know what diplomacy is, Roosevelt announced <clears throat> Roosevelt, this is foreign affairs. This is what Roosevelt does as president in his dealing with foreign countries. Roosevelt, first of all, announced <clears throat> the Roosevelt corollary, the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. Just write all that down. You may not know what any of it is. That's what you come to school to do, to learn new things. Anybody ever heard of the Monroe Doctrine? Just heard of it? I've heard of it. You've heard of it? I'll bet you you all read it. You had, a, you had U.S. history in the eighth grade. You remember the good old days when they gave you a textbook and you didn't have to listen to somebody like me. You just had to sit down and fill out blanks in a worksheet. Right. That's why you still remember the Monroe Doctrine, right? I bet you've all written Monroe Doctrine on the worksheet, and I bet you got credit for it. You made an A. I want to go look at your transcripts. Yeah, you made an A in American history. Yeah, yeah. You don't know George Washington, and you come in here from I don't know, Joe Biden. Yeah, maybe some of you do. Anyway, the Monroe Doctrine's kind of obscure anyway. But uh, write this down, 1823. That's when the Monroe Doctrine was issued. What is the Monroe Doctrine? Doctrine, do you reckon? Anybody know? Somebody might know. Well, get this down. Uh, you know that beginning in 1492, what was the what was the epic great event, event of worldwide event of 1492? What was the epic great event of 1492? What happened? The greatest thing that happened in 1492. Do you know? I bet you do. Do you know? America was discovered. No, America was discovered 20,000 years ago by a group of people called Native Americans. I mean, Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus, you knew that. Columbus came here, came here this part of the world. For, by the way, was he heading to, was that his mission to reach? No. Where was he going? Asia. Huh? Asian. 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 He was a red-headed Italian Jew hired by the king of Spain to sail, whoops, to sail to China. Here he goes, and he was going to surrender and go to China. And as so far as everybody in Europe, here's Europe, so far as all these Europeans know, this was not even here. This was just wide open ocean. If you sail west long enough, you would eventually circle the globe and reach China. And that's where they wanted Columbus to go. And that's where Columbus wanted to go. I'm so tired of hearing these people. I'm so tired of hearing these people that get up and say, well, you know, when I was in school, they said Columbus discovered America. And we know that. Listen, I don't know what school they went to, and I don't know what idiot was teaching them American history, but, uh, you know, if I could bring Columbus back here in the time machine right now, and I could, I could introduce him, and, well, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to, I want to introduce to you the guy that discovered America. He would reach around my neck and choke me for the rest of his life. You know, he came here four times, and for the rest of his life, he said, I didn't go to you. They said, oh, you. there was a German map maker called Amerigo Vespucci, and America came from his name. But they would say, oh, you discovered a new. He said, I didn't discover anything new. Columbus said, I have been to China. I've been to China. Okay. He believed that for the rest of his life. He didn't say, I discovered the new one. Somebody just made that up. But if somebody told you that in history class, it could, could, he didn't. Columbus knew it. Columbus knew it in 1492, for God's sake. I don't know why we don't know it in 2023, but I mean, there are people that still get up and say, well, teary out, well, my teacher taught me to Columbus, and we all know. Of course it was the first people here. The first people here today, we call those people Native Americans. They were here waiting for Columbus. That would have been sort of, Columbus took some of them back to Spain with him. That would have been sort of stupid for him to say, well, I brought these people, you know, and he thought they were Chinese. <laughs> he said, I brought these people, you know, uh, and by the way, I discovered the place. That would be ridiculous, okay? But anyway, enough about Columbus, which I admire a lot of things about Columbus. He's sort of got the, uh, you know, he's sort of on the bad guy list today, but uh, uh, and some, for some things he ought to be. But uh, I, I sort of admire Columbus. But anyway... 
too much on Columbus there. But anyway, in 1492, he did come here, and the Spanish, get this down, the, and he established the Spanish Empire here in this part of the world. And by the way, look at this map. Look at this map. You see right there where it says the United States? From there on down, except for Brazil, from there on down, including all these islands, that was New Spain. The Spanish created the largest empire in the, in, in, in the, in the Americas. By the way, what's the majority language spoken in this part of the world in 2023? What do most people speak as their first language in this? Huh? English? Nope. Spanish. Spanish. If you speak English as a first language, and I do, that's the only language I speak, I'm in a minority group. If you always wanted to be in a minority group and you couldn't find one that would take you, if you, speak, if you live where we live in this hemisphere and you don't speak Spanish, you're in a minority group. So welcome to the club. I'm in that same minority group. The Spanish. It all started with Columbus. But guess what? Uh, the British. Oh, and I'll, I'll ask you another one too. What religion, which religion do most people who live in this hemisphere practice? What is their religion? What did you say? Roman Catholic. Yes, they're Roman Catholics. That's exactly right. If you never think outside of McIntosh County, what would you think they all were? Baptist. Baptist. The vast majority of Christians in the world are Roman Catholics. The vast majority of Christians in our part of the world are Roman Catholics. If you're a Christian and you're not a Roman Catholic and you live in this hemisphere, you're, there's another minority group for you. Some of you have gained two minority group statuses today. You always wanted to be in a minority, but you couldn't find one that would take you. Well, now I'm giving you two. Anyway. Anyway, what about women? Are they a minority group in this great free republic? Not anymore. <laughs> now you're the majority, okay? You can't claim minority status, ladies. So when are you going to get around to electing the president? Anyway, after Columbus came here, get this, the British came, the French came. At one time, there were 13 colonies on the east coast of what is today the United States. They were British. They were owned by the British, okay? All these Europeans came here. Starting in 1492, get this out, starting in 1492. But in 1823, how many years is that? 1592, 1692, 17, 350 years. For 350 years, the Europeans, Spanish, Brits, French, established empires here. But in 1823, the President of the United States, get this down, 1823, the President of the United States, what was his name? What? Well, no, Washington's the first, 1789. Who's, who's, who's the President in 1823? What are we talking about? What am I giving you the background to? The Monroe. So who do you reckon was the President? Monroe. What was his first name? James. James. Okay. <laughs> Get this down. In 1823, James Monroe was president, and he issued his famous doctrine. A doctrine is a statement. It is a document. And in 1823, now with all that background, in 1823, they teach you this in eighth grade history? The answer is? Huh? Really? Okay. Well, you may have. Anyway, <clears throat> James Monroe said, no more European settlements. It's real easy. All that background to come down to that. No more Euro Europeans. You can't establish any more new colonies over here. Now, he says, we're not going to bother the ones you've already got. You can keep them. But no new colonies in the new world. And that was in 1823. That was before Teddy Roosevelt was even born. But in 1905, I think it was, that's not right, we'll just guess. In 1905, get this down, Roosevelt said, you know what? The Monroe Doctrine is not good enough. I'm going to add something to it. So get this down. That's what the Roosevelt Corollary was. 
Monroe Doctrine is not good enough. I'm going to add something to it. And here's what the Monroe, uh, the corollary, Roosevelt's corollary of the Monroe Doctrine said. It said, get this down, if there is a problem in this hemisphere right here, if there is a, if anything bad, if anything happens, not just bad, if there's a problem in this hemisphere, who has the right to fix it? According to Teddy Roosevelt, the United States, write that down. We have the right to fix it. If we have to invade your country to fix what's wrong, we'll do it. We're taking that right. These other countries didn't give the United States that right. These other countries didn't agree with the United States. But Roosevelt said, we're simply taking that. By the way, how did that make us look to these other countries? What? Yeah, like a bunch of the land grabbing imperialists. What else did it make us look like? Controllers. Well, yeah, what's another word for controller? Uh, You're right. Huh? Tyrannical. Radic tyrannical, yeah, tyrannical. Emperor. Huh? Yeah. I was just thinking, I'm, my, my mind is much more simple than yours, but I was just thinking, a bullet. Right. Get this down. Maybe, it's, I don't know, maybe. All that you said is fine, but maybe you get this down. Maybe you not say something like bullies. And this is one of the, I think this is one of the great failings of Teddy Roosevelt. He damaged, you get this down, you'll see this on your test. Roosevelt damaged, <clears throat> Roosevelt damaged hemispheric relations. And you know, there's still some of that today. There's still some of that today. A lot of uh, this part, the southern part of the western hemisphere, a lot of this looks with suspicion on the United States. They said they're big, they're big, they're powerful, they're the richest country in this part of the world. You've got to watch the United States. And that goes back to Teddy Roosevelt. That was one of Roosevelt's great failings, okay? So, uh, you understand uh, the Roosevelt corollary. Anybody got any, anyone have any questions uh, over that? Well, yes, anybody got any questions? All right, right now the Panama Canal. I'm going to tell you how we got the Panama Canal real quick. Let's see how much time. Ooh, I don't think I made it. Is this over at 10 after? Yes. Draft. Okay, well, right now the Panama Canal. <clears throat> and that's where we'll take it up tomorrow. Good job today.